In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson explains how we can be ignorant to the changes in our environment. That was standard. That was a standard idea in psychology for the longest period of time. That we we created a detailed internal model of the world, and we watched how the world was unfolding. We compared the two, and the physiology, the, the neurophysiology of this was even understood to some degree, even by the Russians in the early 1960s, because they basically localized, you could use e complex EEG, electroencephalogram technology, to localize where the orienting reflex was occurring in the brain, and basically it appeared to occur, roughly speaking, in the hippocampus, and the theory arose that your brain, your cortex, let's say, produced a very complex model of the world, an internal model, and your senses were producing a model of the external world and the hippocampus was watching those two things to see if they matched and if they didn't match, there was a mismatch signal and that would be the orienting reflex and then your body would start to prepare would prepare itself for whatever that mismatch meant and then you would engage in exploratory behavior to try to update your model that was the standard theory and it was very well accepted theory um, it has elements of cybernetic theory in it, but it was well accepted enough so that when people first started to experiment with artificial intelligence that's how they tried to make artificially intelligent systems, they tried to make ones that would model the world and then act and then compare the changes in the world to that model but that didn't go anywhere as it turned out because it, it turned out that it's so, it's so difficult to see and model the world that people had People had no idea how complex that was. It was impossibly complex, as it turned out. And so that's part of the reason we don't have robots wandering around doing apparently simple things like walking, you know, walking in an environment like this. Now, when we look at the environment, we think, well, it's not that much diff it's not that hard to look at. It's full of objects, and they're just self-evident. There they are, and we can just wander through it, you know. And we don't even do that consciously to, to any great degree because so much of that perception is presented to our consciousness without effort, in some sense, but the AI guys learned pretty quick that perceiving the world was way more difficult than anybody had guessed, and then this experiment really, in some sense, put the phenomenological, put a phenomenological punch behind that observation, because one of the presuppositions of the orienting reflex theory that I just laid out was that you were very good at detecting changes that your nervous system would automatically detect change, anomaly, right? Any mismatch between your model and what you expected. And then, well, the AI guys, I think, figured out, first of all, that that was a big problem, that the problem of perception was much more complicated than that. You know, it's actually, it's out of that same set of observations, in some sense, that postmodernism emerged in literature, because, in literary criticism, because, well, it's, it turns out to be hard enough to see a normal object like a chair, and part of that is, is the, you know, if you just do that to the chair, it's really different than it was before. You could imagine how different it would be if you tried to paint the chair under both those conditions, right? And if you really got good at looking at it, you'd find that even though if I asked you what color this is, you'd say white, if you were actually painting it, you'd find out that the colors of the chair when it's in that location and the colors in the chair when it's in that location, just because of the difference in lighting, are substantially different. I think it was Monet, I think, who painted a very large series of haystacks in the French countryside, right, under, in different seasons and under different conditions of illumination just because he was exploring how radically different the same object could be as it moved through contexts and so it isn't even obvious why we think this is the same object when you move it and the answer is something like, well you can sit on it in both positions which is not a description of an object by the way right? that's a description of something that's useful, something that's a tool, something that exists in relationship to your body it's not an object and so if you think that just looking at something like a chair is almost impossibly difficult and subject to interpretation then imagine how difficult it is to perceive something like a text you know, like a novel because a novel ob obviously is subject to multiple interpretations and the interpretations are going to depend on well, at least in principle on the intent, conscious and unconscious of the author of the time, of the place, of the culture, of the language then that's just on the side of the production itself, but then there's the reader, it's like I've read books when I was 
16 and then reread them, say, when I was 40, and the book was almost completely different as far as I was concerned, partly because I knew it, I knew what was in it the second time, and I didn't know what was in it the first time. And so the, the meaning that manifests itself out of a book is a consequence of all the complexity of the book, plus all the complexity of the reader. And so, you know, if, you've, if you're reading Russian literature, for example, and you've already read 50, 50 Russian novels, you're going to be in a much more different, you're going to be in a different interpretive space than you are if, say, the Russian novel is the first novel you've ever read. And it, so, and the postmodernists were grappling with this, with, as, as well as with many other ideas that I think contaminated their thinking. And their conclusion was, well, you can't extract out a canonical meaning from a text. It's so dependent on the situation that to say the text has a interpretable meaning is actually an error. Now, just because it's difficult to do something doesn't mean it's impossible. And there's massive holes in the postmodernist view, as far as I think it's an unbelievably pathological view, personally. But, but the thing is, is that th there are reasons why it emerged, and the reasons were analogous to the reasons that the AI project initially failed, and analogous to the reasons that this experiment turned out the way it did. So I'm going to show you this. Many of you have seen this already, but as I said, it doesn't matter. So the, the, the job, your job here is to count the time. You see there's a team of three people here dressed in white, and there's a team of three people here dressed in black. And your job is to count the number of times the white team throws the basketball back and forth to the white team members, okay? So we'll just run that. Okay, well, so obviously, uh, or perhaps not so obviously, the, um, the number of times I believe that they threw, it back, they threw it back and forth was 16, if I remember this correctly. But, of course, that's not really the issue, because what happens in the middle of the scene is that a guy wearing a gorilla suit comes out into the middle of the screen and pounds his chest three or four times. And he comes out quite slowly, as, as you saw. How many of you, is there anybody here who didn't see the gorilla? No, well, you, and I presume all of you knew about this video anyways. So, uh, Dan Simon, who produced this video, has got a couple of other ones where he shows that, uh, you know, even if you're smart enough to see the gorilla, because you've seen the, the video before, you've heard about it, if you make other changes in the background, you'll, you'll count properly and you'll catch the gorilla, but you'll miss the other changes in the background. And they're not trivial either. And it's really quite remarkable. He's produced other... Uh, uh, short videos, for example, where you'll be looking at a, like a field um, and a road will grow in it, occupying about a third of the photograph space. And you'd think, well, yeah, you're going to see that. It's like, you don't, you don't. So, okay, so this threw, this threw a big spanner into the works, this sort of experiment, along with the AI failures. And we could even say the postmodern dilemma. It's like, well, hmm, everyone virtually, every psychologist, would have predicted before this series of experiments that there's no damn way you'd miss that gorilla because your nervous system was actually attuned to change in the environment and like that's a big change and, and it's also a gorilla it's something you would really think that you couldn't miss you couldn't possibly miss especially when it's occupying the center of the of the visual field and so well this is part of a phenomena called change blindness and it helped psychologists who had been studying the visual system for a very long time figure out, well, mostly figure out exactly how blind human beings are, because we're way blinder than we think. And, and so we actually focus on much less of the world than we think. And um, we do that partly, it's not exactly obvious how we do it. It's kind of like we, we hold a still picture in our imagination and then fill in the details by using our central foveal vision, which is always dancing around like a, like a pinpoint or a laser beam moving back and forth. And we're assembling those little snapshots from the fovea into a relatively coherent picture. 